Shalom, shalom, family. Once again, the Walls of Jericho is in the building, brothers and sisters. Um, like I said, I represent the Walls of Jericho Biblical and Historical Studies and Hebrews in the Hood Entertainment. I am Cassius Israel, a.k.a. Kazak or Shazak Ben Yehuda. And we are going to get it in as usual, brothers and sisters. And as usual, um, play some music for y'all. Um, I want to make this disclaimer. I do not own the rights to this music. This is um, for, for, for educational purposes only, according to the Fair Use Act. Let's go. Come on in, brothers and sisters. We're going to get it in now. Shalom to all that came in. Shalom to you. Shalom. Shalom to everybody that came in. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom, family. Shalom. Shalom.
right, all right. And of course, you know, our policy over here, we don't believe in camp banging or name banging either. So shout out to my brothers from AOC. Doesn't matter if you're radical, doesn't matter if you're moderate. We don't bang. All about the spirit over here. Now, let's get into this lesson, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> and the reason why I wanted to do this, because it really trips me out. It really trips me out. And these are people in the truth that don't know how to establish when a sin is, a com is committed. Or don't know how to establish finding out what is wrong according to the scriptures, right? Case in point, when there is a controversial subject, right? And you get in your feelings about it, right? And you don't necessarily like what's being said. A lot of people in the truth will go straight to the New Testament and nothing else. Brothers and sisters, there are no laws in the New Testament that have not been established in the Old Testament, right? For instance, that's like you going to court, right? And you go to the judge, you say, Your Honor, I got two witnesses that this person did me wrong. Two witnesses, Your Honor. The judge going to sit here and say, okay, show me the law of the crime that has been committed. You just going to keep saying, but Your Honor, I got two witnesses, though. Two witnesses. I got two witnesses that have testimonies on this person doing me wrong. But you haven't established a law behind that testimony, brothers and sisters. So you can't get in your feelings and go straight to the New Testament and then all of a sudden, now you didn't made a law. No, you have to establish that is a law to show that it's talking about that in the New Testament, which is the testimony, brothers and sisters. So this is what we're going to do today. Not only that, but we got groups out here that say that breaking down the Bible precept upon precept, and we're going to get into what that means, is not how you get understanding of the Bible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that that is how you get understanding, and I want somebody to prove to me how else do you get understanding but by what has been told by the prophets, brothers and sisters. That doesn't make any sense, right? So, of course, we're going to show this is how you get understanding. We're also going to show that you cannot have a testimony without a law and then try to convict somebody from a, for a crime, right? So, we're going to start this in Isaiah, the 28th chapter. And the title of this lesson is, To the Law, the law and the Testimony, Precept Must Be Upon Precept, Line Must Be Upon Line. We're going to show the law. Which is what a precept is, brothers and sisters. Precept just generally means law or a rule that dictates somebody's behavior. This is what a precept is, right? So let's start this in Isaiah, the 28th chapter. Isaiah, the 28th chapter. And so we're going to get some back history on this. What's going on, bro? We're going to get some back history on this. And this is showing that. Ephraim or Israel, this uh, particular case, they got drunk off all this new wine, which is new doctrine, and that the Lord is going to uh, uh, give them a crown of glory for his sake, of course, because the pride and the drunkenness of Ephraim have just gone too far, right? They didn't went off course. Then he's going to explain how do you get knowledge and understanding so that you can get back on course, right? Uh, excuse me, right? So, let's start this at um, Isaiah, the 28th chapter, and we're going to start this at verse 7. Isaiah, the 28th chapter, and we're going to start this at verse 7. Isaiah 28 and verse 7. We're going to see some of these questions that are being asked that let you know this is how you get understanding from the Bible, brothers and sisters, Right? Isaiah 28 and verse 7. And verse 7 reads, But they also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink, right? Or the priest and the prophet have erred through bad doctrine. They've been out here teaching bad doctrine, and so they are in error, brothers and sisters, right? Let's continue. They are swallowed up of wine. They are... I'm sorry. Yeah, they are swallowed up of wine. 
They uh, they are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision and they stumble in judgment. So that's what it's talking about, right? You're erring. The prophets will err in vision and the priests will err in judgment, right? So what else is he saying? Verse 8. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is none place clean, right? So if you're dealing with anything else besides this, brothers and sisters, it's vomit. Right, it's vomit, and then there's no place clean. So now let's get into how you understand how things are unclean, how things are vomit. How do you have right judgment and right vision? Right, let's continue. Verse 9 Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? That is the key, brothers and sisters. Who shall he teach? Knowledge, talking about the Lord, right? And who shall he make to understand doctrine? Now, what is coming after this is the answer to these questions. And people will sit here all day long and say, that's not how you, that's, that, that's not how you understand the Bible. What if the, the question said, who shall he teach knowledge and who shall he make to understand doctrine? That is right before he goes into how you do it. So how are you going to say that's not how you do it? That don't make no sense, right? Let's continue. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So we're now going into the next section of when somebody comes in and they're new. Now we get into how you really get these oracles, how you really get this understanding, right? Because now you're weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. You're becoming off of the milk and you're getting into the meat of the situation, right? Let's see the answer right here. Verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a, uh, uh, here a little and there a little, right? So this is what we're going to do. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, right? Verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, right? So he's going to get into even making sure because he knew that Israel was going to be scattered all over the world, right? He's going to make sure that you understand this in the language that you are speaking. So there is no excuse for you not getting this, right? Let us continue. Why shall he do this, right? Verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing Yet they would not hear. Now, even though this is the rest and the refreshing, and I'm going to make sure you understand doctrine by precept upon precept, in any language that you speak, they still not going to hear this, right? Right? Because that's rebellion, right? You don't want to hear it even if it's broke down to you correctly, right? Let's continue. Verse 13. But the word of the Lord. Y'all hear that? The word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. How can you get out of that, brothers and sisters? How is that not the right way to break this down? If it says, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, law upon law, line upon line, because you also have testimonies or you have stories in the Bible that testify to the law that's being talked about, right? We're going to see that. Uh, let us continue. He said, precept must be upon precept, Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and taken, brothers and sisters, right? So that is the purpose for doing all of that, because you're going to fall backwards like, dang, this is really what it is, right? You're going to be taken. You're going to be snared. It's going to convict you in your heart, because when you start really understanding this, you're going to realize that you're an heir, just like Ephraim was, right? So, let us continue. Let's get into this. Let's go to Isaiah the 8th chapter. Isaiah the 8th chapter. Now we're going to get into how do I make sure I'm speaking the accuracy of this word, precept upon precept. Isaiah 8. Isaiah the 8th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 16. Isaiah the 8th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 16. <clears throat> Isaiah the 8th chapter and verse 16. 
Now we're doing a here a little and there a little, right? Because we didn't necessarily get into the laws yet. We're going to do that. But that's why all of that was said, right? Because there are things in here that are talk. They're talking about the stories or prophecies, brothers and sisters, right? Prophecies that you go into the New Testament and you testify that this prophecy has been fulfilled or this prophecy is continuing to um, as far as being uh, uh, in the future, right? And so you'll have testimonies in the New Testament that will show what the prophets are saying or at least it will uh, extend what the prophets are saying in a longer time period, right? So we have that as well. We're going to see that as well. Um, Isaiah the 8th chapter. And we're going to start at verse 16. Isaiah 8 and verse 16. And verse 16 reads, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So you have to have both. That's what we're going to get into, right? Verse 17. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him, right? Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion, right? So the children of Israel, the Lord and the children of Israel are here for those signs, brothers and sisters, are here to teach that wisdom, brothers and sisters, right? The priest were commissioned to make sure all the rest of the sons and daughters of Adam understood what the Lord was saying to us, right? Let us... Um, continue skip down to verse 20 verse 20 reads to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them or no truth in them brothers and sisters right so that's what we're going to do we're going to establish something in the law and then we're going to go to the testimony to find out what this is now now how many witnesses do you need to establish a sin, brothers and sisters, right? Let's go find that out. Let's go to Deuteronomy, the 19th chapter. And, of course, with this, is showing you how things are broken down, like when you're going into court, right? You need witnesses to attest for a crime. Only problem is, is that you can have two or three witnesses that are lying, brothers and sisters, right? Just like there's a whole bunch of witnesses that testify to the Sunday doctrine, right? But we all know that's wrong, right? So the witnesses that we're going to focus on is the witnesses from Genesis to Revelations. These are all different witnesses of the same thing, brothers and sisters. So now we're going to start with Moses, right? Let's go to Deuteronomy 19. Let's start with Moses. Deuteronomy 19, and we're going to start at verse 15. Deuteronomy 19, and we're going to start at verse 15. Now, this is the lawgiver, so we got to start from the lawgiver and then work our way on down, brothers and sisters, right? Deuteronomy 19, and we're going to start at verse 15. Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15. And verse 15 reads, I'm sorry. <clears throat> verse 15 what witness shall not rise up against any man for any iniquity or or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall a matter be established and i always tell people this make sure you not a false witness because if you're sitting here like oh man they did this that and the third they gonna get it what you think going to happen to them if you are a false witness, in this particular case, if you bring it to the judges and the priests, and then they do a, a diligent inquisition, and they see that you are a false witness, what, it, what you thought was going to happen to that person going to happen to you. That's why I tell people, get this right. Because if you're wrong, it's a consequence for being a false witness, brothers and sisters. Right? Let's continue. Um, where am I? Oh. Verse 16, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men 
<coughs> excuse me, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priest and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness and have testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he hath thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. Y'all hear that, right? If you are a false witness, what you think is going to happen to your brother is going to surely happen to you, right? So we want to be careful, brothers and sisters, when we get into this, right? And why do we do this, right? Because we're also going to prove that the law is not done away with, right? We're going to get all of that in here, brothers and sisters, right? Why would the law be done away with when the explanation for the law is this? Let's go see what that is. Let's go to Psalms uh, 19. Now, y'all see how I'm speaking? <clears throat> you see how I'm speaking, right? And I understand where these places are so I can connect the dots on these, uh, the line upon line and the precepts upon precepts, brothers and sisters, right? So, like I said, let's go see why you cannot say the law is done away with, right? Let's go to Psalms 19. Psalms 19. Psalms, the 19th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 7. Psalms, the 19th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 7. Psalms 19 and verse 7. And verse 7 reads, The law of the Lord is perfect, right? So if God is perfect, we're not going to do away with God. So if the law is perfect, why would we do away with the law, brothers and sisters, right? It's perfect. Now let's see what the law does, right? He said the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So if you don't have the law, brothers and sisters, you cannot convert the soul. You see how simple that is, right? But we make this so complicated, right? The law of the Lord is perfect and it converts the soul, right? Let's continue. <clears throat> The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. So from the law and the testimony, the, uh, the simple will become wise. This is why we need to understand how to break this down and so we can understand knowledge and so we can understand doctrine, right? Let's continue. Verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So how can we do away with that, brothers and sisters? That don't make that makes no sense. We're gonna do away with what is pure. We're gonna do away with what is enlightening to the eyes. What makes the uh, the the uh, simple wise? What converts the soul? The law, the testimony, the commandment, the judgments. And the statutes. We need it all, right? We need it all, brothers and sisters. So let's get into that. So the first, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you know what? Let's uh, establish that you do need two or more witnesses to establish a matter, right? So let's go to Paul. We just went to David with that. Let's go to Paul. And Paul said the same thing David said, brothers and sisters. Uh, um, if you go to Romans, the seventh chapter. Paul said that the law was just, holy, and good. David said that the law was perfect, right? So you know if it's holy, you know that it's perfect, brothers and sisters. It's coming from God, right? You see how that is? We just established the matter with the law with two witnesses, right? David and Paul. Now we're going to establish the two or three witnesses with Moses and Paul. Let's see that. Let's go to um, first Corinth, uh, Second Corinthians, the 13th chapter. 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. And we're going to read one verse. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. One verse, brothers and sisters. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 1. And verse 1 reads, This is the third time I am coming to, uh, coming to you, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Boom. Law, 
testimony. Y'all see how that? Two witnesses. Moses and Paul both said that you need the law, that you need two witnesses, two witnesses or three witnesses to establish a matter. Jesus said that as well, brothers and sisters. So we got all these witnesses to that fact, right? Now let's go let's go into it, right? Now let's deal with adultery, right? That's a law, right? Let's deal with adultery. From the law and to the testimony, right? Let's go to Exodus the 20th chapter. We're going back to Moses. We're going back to Moses. Exodus 20, and we're going to start at verse, well, we're going to read one verse, verse 14. Exodus the 20th chapter, and we're going to read verse 14. Exodus 20 and verse 14. We're dealing with adultery here, brothers and sisters. And verse 14 reads, Thou shalt not commit adultery, right? So now I want to uh, uh, I want to understand, well, what is committing adultery, right? If you're bringing somebody that don't know nothing, you have to establish what this is, right? Let's go do that. Let's go to um, <clears throat> Leviticus 18 and 20. Leviticus 18 and 20. Right, so we're going to establish what adultery is, right? Leviticus 18 and verse 20. Leviticus 18 and verse 20. We're still in Mo with Moses, brothers and sisters. And verse 20 reads, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with. Right? This is adultery when a man lays with another man's wife. Right? Now, y'all see, I read, thou shalt not commit adultery. But this says, moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife. How do I know this is adultery? That's what you ask yourself. That's what the precepts are for, right? This is a law. The first law was Exodus 20 and um, 10, the, uh, 14, I'm sorry, Exodus 20 and 14. The next one was Leviticus 18 and 20. Now we're going to Leviticus 20 to establish that adultery is laying with another man's wife, right? That's how we get this understanding, brothers and sisters. Let's go to Leviticus, the 20th chapter. Leviticus, the 20th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 10. Leviticus, the 20th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 10. Leviticus 20 and verse 10. And verse 10 reads, And the man that committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Now we have established that laying with another man's wife is adultery. This is precept upon precept that will give you knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, brothers and sisters. This is how this is going to work, right? Let us continue. Now let's go to the prophets. We just went to Moses. Now let's go to Jeremiah to, uh, to establish it. Let's go to Jeremiah the uh, fifth chapter. Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. Jeremiah, the fifth chapter, and we're going to start at verse seven. Jeremiah, the fifth chapter, and we're going to start at verse seven. Jeremiah five and verse seven. Five and seven. And verse 7 reads, How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me. Now, understand what he's saying, right? Your ch the children of Israel have forsaken me, right? And he can, you can only forsake God if you go against or go contrary to his law, statutes, commandments. Let us establish that, right? He said, They have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. When I had fed them to the full... They then committed adultery. Oh, they then committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops and harlots' houses, right? So we're going to also acknowledge that if you commit adultery against God, since you are married and made a covenant with God, it is adultery, but this is also idolatry, brothers and sisters, right? Adultery to the Most High God is idolatry, right? And he said, because of that, you have forsaken me. So you see that adultery is wrong, right? Let's get into the more 
a, a physical part of adultery, right? Verse 8, they were as fed horses in the morning, everyone neighed at his neighbor's wife. So you like a horse neighing at your neighbor's wife, right? Let's see how he feels. Verse 9, shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? And shall not my soul be avenged as such a nation as this, right? So that's the question that he's asking, brothers and sisters, right? This lets you know this is wrong, right? Because he's upset about it. If it wasn't wrong, he wouldn't be upset. But do you see how we are establishing? We went to Moses. Now we're in Jeremiah, showing that these things are wrong by the law and the prophets. The only witnesses that you need, brothers and sisters, right? So he said, everyone neighed, that, that always tripped me up, everyone neighed at his neighbor's wife, right? Let's continue. Go ye, verse 10, go ye up upon the, her walls and destroy, but make not a full end, take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's, right? So he go, go in and destroy this, uh, 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 this civilization or this nation. Destroy them, right? Because he says, shall I not avenge for these things, right? How can I pardon you for these things, right? Let's continue. Verse 11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherous, treacherously against me, saith the Lord. So we establishing that it was treacherous activity that was happening from Israel and Judah, brothers and sisters. What was it? Adultery, right? We see adultery. Or, in the Most High's case, idolatry, but it's still adultery, right? So we are establishing that adultery is a law, and if you break it, it is a sin. And we're seeing with the prophets that this is what he uh, 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 does not like, right? He will get upset about this. Let us continue. Let's go to 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. Now we're going to deal with uh, 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 David, right? 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 2. 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 2. 2 Samuel 11 and verse 2. And verse 2 reads, And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman, uh, a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So let's see if this was lawful for him to do this, right? Verse 3, and David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is, this, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hishite? So we establishing that this is another man's wife right and david is looking upon this woman and sees that she is beautiful and he inquired after her right but what happened so now if you are really keeping the law brothers and sisters which once you hear something like that you should want to stop doing it because you know it is against the word of the god right but let's see what david did uh, verse 4, and David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. Okay, so he lay with Uriah the Hishite's wife, right? So he says he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. You know what's funny? <laughs> and this is why I say, I'm going to keep it uh, PG, this is some Negro stuff, right? Because this man... <laughs> This man waited until she was off her period as if, you know what? We can't do this. This is wrong. We can't lay with each other while you're on your period, right? But this is another man's wife. Like you thought, of, you thought about the period, but you didn't think about the fact that she was another man's wife at that time, right? So we have established that David had laid with another man's wife. Let us go see what, how the most high feels about this, right? Let's go to the next chapter. 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 1. 2 Samuel 12 and verse 1. 
And verse 1 reads, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man was exceeding, was exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little eway land, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter, right? Now, Nathan is establishing the story because he about to, he about to uh, bring it to him that, look, man, I was sent by the Most High God to tell you about yourself, right? And to let you know what the Lord is about to do to you, right? David had many wives, right? He had many wives, but you want this man's one little wife. He got one wife. You got all these wives, and you want his, right? And this is what he's establishing, right? Verse 4. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was, that was come to him. And, and, and David angered, and David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Not even realizing he's the man that Nathan is talking about, right? So he getting all mad. This, <laughs> this is how sometimes, brothers and sisters, even if you're a man after God's own heart, once you've done something wrong, you will go that far to get out of it and you can't right because the lord is always watching brothers and sisters he's always watching so anything you think you're gonna get away with he sees it right and he will punish you for it as we're about to see right so david's anger was kindled but he's not realizing that this is talking about me and he should have he shouldn't even been mad like that because you just did the same thing that nathan is talking about this other man did right like i said not knowing that he's talking about you talking about david verse six and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity and nathan said to david thou art that man right so you are that man so he's gonna get into telling him what i'm actually here for i'm just sizing you up for it right and the response is crazy so you end up responding like that like man surely as the lord liveth this man gonna be put to death so he had to feel crazy after it was revealed to him that he was that man right let's continue uh thus saith the lord god of israel i anointed thee king over israel and i delivered thee out of the hand of saul i gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom right because you got all these wives why you need this man's wife and you got all these wives, right? Then look what he said to him. I gave thee thy master's house and I gave thee thy master's wives uh, into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had not, that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. So whatever you had wanted, I would have multiplied, right? I would have multiplied just like I gave you thy master's wife. I mean, a uh, master's house and thy master's wives, and I gave you Israel and Judah, and you still were not satisfied, right? You still had to go take this man's wife, right? Let's continue. Uh, let's see what the response from the Lord is now, right? Verse 9. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? So we're establishing now, brothers and sisters, from the law and the testimony that committing adultery with another man's wife is seen as evil in the sight of the Lord. How are you not going to do this and get understanding? How are you going to do anything else and get understanding like this, right? You're not going to read through this whole thing from front to back and get that understanding like that. It is not written like that. You can get some understanding and reading it from front to back right but overall eventually when you're weaned off the milk and drawn from the breast you must start doing precept upon precept 
line upon line, brothers and sisters, right? Let's continue. Not only did he did that with Uriah's wife, let's see what he did with Uriah. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hishite with the sword, right? If you go back to the next chapter, you can read it on your own. It will show you that he ended up sending Uriah out to the most one of the most dangerous wars they had at that time, and he put him in the front line so he could die, right? It was all strategic, right? So he would have, uh, thou hast killed Uriah the Hishite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon, right? He went out, they were warned against the Ammonites at this time, right? These are the children of Lot. Verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hishite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, just thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto the, uh, thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son, right? And that ended up being his son that laid with one of his wives or one of his concubines, which is still a wife, right? And man, now, now, see, this is the judgment. Now we're seeing the judgment of the Lord when you have broken the law, brothers and sisters, right? So we know that this is wrong. We know that committing adultery is wrong in the sight of the Lord, right? Verse 12, for thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Now, Watch that too, brothers and sisters, because you can be doing something in secret, and as soon as the judgment of the Most High comes upon you, he going to do it openly, right? He going to embarrass you. That's why you better get be on the ball, because not only not only can you, will you get cut off, brothers and sisters, but all the people that you around, if you out here faking the funk and, and, and preaching one thing and doing another, it's going to be put out for everybody to see. Because he's going to see that you're being a hypocrite, right? He don't want people listening to this hypocrite. So he's going to make sure your name is tarnished. Your reputation is now tarnished because you're not living to glorify him, right? So we want to be mindful of that, right? Now let us continue. Now we went to Sam, we went to Moses, we went to Jeremiah. Now we are in Samuel. Let us now go back to Paul to establish this. Let's go to Galatians, the fifth chapter. Galatians, the fifth chapter. Galatians, the fifth chapter, and we're going to start at verse 16. Galatians, the fifth chapter, and we're going to start at verse 16. 16. Let's see if I get that. Galatians 5 and verse 16. Galatians 5 and verse 16. And verse 16 reads, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So let's see what the lust of the flesh is, right? For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit lust uh, uh, in the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Right. So if you live after the flesh, brothers and sisters, you are not living in the law of God. It's you. You can't be right because the if you live after the flesh, the carnal mind or the fleshly mind is enmity against God. It hates God. Why? Because it's not subject to the law of God, brothers and sisters. That's why it's contrary one of the other, right? But let's see these categories. Verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these. What's the first one? Adultery, brothers and sisters. The first one is adultery, right? Adultery, fornication, fornication is a form of adultery, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, which is spiritual adultery, brothers and sisters. We're going to get to that too. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envies, murderers, drunkenness, and revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past, 
that they which do the such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So we already have established, brothers and sisters, that an adulterer cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That is precept upon precept. So that you know what you are up against. So you know how to understand how to get your salvation and how to get into the kingdom of God, right? So we just did adultery, brothers and sisters, right? Let us go into the next section. Now we are going to do the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. So we're going to ask, is the Sabbath day done away with? Right? That's the question, right? So I have to use precept upon precept, line upon line, to establish if somebody is telling me the Sabbath is done away with, I have to establish that that's not true. Otherwise, I have no light or truth in me, right? Let's go to Exodus, the 20th chapter. Going back to Exodus. Exodus, the 20th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 8. Wait a uh, hold on, let me see. I might be going into the wrong section, but that is okay. Hold on. We're going to get all of these out, too. Okay, this is right. So Exodus, the 20th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 8. Exodus, the 20th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 8. Shalom to all the people that just tuned in. Shalom to you. Exodus 20 and verse 8. Exodus, the 20th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 8. And verse 8 reads, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the, seventh, the Sabbath day and hallowed it, right? So that is the commandment, right? That is the law. We're at Moses again. We're establishing the law or the precept for the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters, right? So, let us go see why we keep the Sabbath day. No matter if we're in the new old covenant or the new covenant, we are supposed to keep the Sabbath day. Let's go to Exodus, the 31st chapter. We're still in with Moses. Exodus, the 31st chapter, and we're going to start at verse 12. Exodus, the 31st chapter, and we are going to start at verse 12. Exodus 31 and verse 12. 31 and 12. And verse 12 reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you, right? So the Sabbath day is a sign that you are the people of God. So how can you do away what is the sign that shows you are the people of God? That don't make no sense, brothers and sisters, right? That doesn't make sense, right? Let's continue. Verse 14, ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is, for it is holy unto you, Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death, for whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. So this is the judgment of the Sabbath day, and we're going to see if, because people think that when Christ died on the cross, the Sabbath day went with him. So what we're going to see is Christ keeping the Sabbath day and people after he died keeping the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters, right? Let's continue. Verse 16. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. A perpetual, meaning a never-ending, never-changing covenant. How can you do away something that's perpetual, brothers and sisters, 
right? But of course, when you're dealing with New Testament uh, uh, only people, they're not trying to hear this from the Old Testament. So we got to show them that this thing is perpetual, meaning to them after Christ died, right? So we're going to see that, right? Verse 17, um, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. How, how absolute is forever, brothers and sisters, right? A sign forever, right? For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed, right? So we understand by Moses, the, the witness of Moses, that the Sabbath day is forever and it's perpetual covenant. He is the lawgiver, right? Let us continue. Now, let's go to Nehemiah, right? Let's get Nehemiah as a witness. Nehemiah, the 13th chapter. Nehemiah, the 13th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 15. Nehemiah, the 13th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 15. Nehemiah uh, 13 and verse 15. 13 and verse 15. That's right, everlasting, right? 13 and 15. <clears throat> and verse 15 reads, In those days saw I uh, in those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into the uh, into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, and I testified against them in the day wherein they were they sold victuals. Now, I know a lot of people, and if you got uh, any other uh, uh, evidence that says otherwise, I know a lot of people think that burdens are things like what our emotions, things that we are upset about. Don't bring that to the Sabbath day, this, that, and the other. But when this is talking about burdens, brothers and sisters, we're talking about merchandise, merchandise that you can sell, right? So don't bring any burdens um, on the Sabbath day. Don't bring anything to sell to the people on the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters, right? Let's continue. Which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, and I testified against them in the day wherein they were they sold victuals, right? There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware and ware and burdens. It's all the same thing. Product, um, 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 property, um, supplies, merchandise is all it's, it's synonymous. Um, let's continue. And sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. So we're seeing that it is evil to buy on the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters, right? Then I can and sell, buy and sell on the Sabbath day. We're just going to deal with that, right? Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do? And profane the Sabbath day. So if you are buying or selling on the Sabbath day, you have profaned the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters, right? That is what they're saying in plain English, simple, uh, simple, simple stuff. Verse 18, did not your fathers thus and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath day. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, right? Which shows us also that the Sabbath starts when the sun goes down, brothers and sisters. Why? Because he said that um, be, uh, when it, um, he said, and it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark, began before the Sabbath day, before. So if he were to close the gates before the, uh, when it completely got dark, brothers and sisters, he would have been working on the Sabbath day. Work, we established that work, buying, selling, is profaning the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters, and this is something he doesn't like, right? Let us continue. Uh, I commanded that the gates of uh, gates should be shut 
and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I out at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? Now look at what he's about to say. Why would he say this if it was not wrong, brothers and sisters, right? He said, if ye do so, he said, why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. That sound like a brother, right? Y'all don't hear that from no other nation but us. We even say that in this time frame. I'm going to lay hands on you if you keep playing with me, right? So I will lay hands on you if you bring in merchandise to sell on the Sabbath day, right? And what did they do? From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. So he pleading and praying to God to remember him from doing this, from keeping people from selling and buying on the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters, right? So we see with Nehemiah that doing this is wrong. He's another witness, right? So we went from the law, right? Because the whole Old Testament can be known as the law, brothers and sisters. That's why we're doing old and new, right? But this is testifying to the law of Moses, right? So let us continue. Now we are going to the New Testament to see if they were keeping the Sabbath day at that time, right? Let's go to Luke, the fourth chapter. Luke, the fourth chapter. Luke, the fourth chapter, and we're going to start at verse 14. Luke, the fourth chapter, and we're going to start at verse 14. Luke 4 and 14. Luke, the fourth chapter, and we're going to start at verse 14. And verse 14 reads, And Jesus returned into the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now watch this, verse 16. And he, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Right? Right? As his custom, brothers and sisters, right? This is custom. His lifestyle was that he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now, if we're going to follow Christ, why would, not, why would we not keep the Sabbath day holy like the law said, right? Let's see what he did on the Sabbath. And stood up for, and stood up for to read. You mean Christ is reading, brothers and sisters? <laughs> Right. I don't know if y'all ever saw that um coming to America, right? And um when 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 um Eddie Murphy's when 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 Eddie Murphy's uh father, James Earl uh I think it's James Earl Jones, when he found out that his son was working, he was I'm sorry. <laughs> My son works, you know what I'm saying? So I'm looking at this like the son of God reads. You see what I'm saying? Yes, he's reading, but this is because he's in the flesh, he's in the natural. He has to be an example of showing you, you got to study to understand this book. You have to do precept upon precept to understand this book, brothers and sisters, right? So that's why he stood up for to read, right? So now we have established that Christ was keeping the Sabbath day. Let's see if they were keeping the Sabbath day after Christ. Let's go to Acts the 13th chapter. Acts the 13th chapter. This is way after Christ. So all y'all that think that we don't have to keep the Sabbath day, you got some explaining to do, right? Because we're doing precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You have to show what, you got to show your case. Because if you ain't doing it like this, how, you gonna, how are you going to uh, 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 convince me that I don't have to keep the Sabbath day? You can't just use the New Testament to do it. Right? The prophet said that you need the law and the testimony, brothers and sisters, right? 
thir uh, Acts the 13th chapter. Acts the 13th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 4. <clears throat> Acts the 13th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 4. Acts 13 and verse 4. And verse 4 reads, So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto uh, Seleucia, Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Sal Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to, to their minister. Now, brothers and sisters, if I was trying to, to get people not to keep the Sabbath day because the Sabbath day is done away with after Christ. Why would I be going into people's synagogues on the Sabbath day? Why wouldn't I have already established shape? This is our day like Sunday. This is our day. So when y'all want to hear the word of God, come to church on Sunday. Why are we going to get people out of the synagogues on the Sabbath day, right? Then I'm, I'm, I want to ask, I want to ask anybody that believes this. Can you prove that they were teaching them not to keep the Sabbath when they were going in the synagogue? You can't do that with the New Testament. You can't do that. You cannot do that, brothers and sisters. And you got to think about that, right? You have to think about that. Let us skip down to verse 13. Right. So we know that uh, the these these disciples um, we're going into the synagogues on the Sabbath day with the Jews. Then we have more people going in there. Let's see that. Verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Pat, uh, Patmos, they, they came unto Perga in Paphilia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So John was with Paul and his company, and they were all together preaching in the synagogues the word of God on the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters, right? But the thing that they were doing is that they were trying to bring people to Christ up under the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is Christ, rather than the order of Aaron. That's all they were doing, brothers and sisters. That's what they were doing, showing who Christ was, right? Verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the what? So they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they were hearing the law and the prophets be read. Now, can you say that they preached against the law and the prophets when they did, when they got in there? No, brothers and sisters, and you don't see that nowhere in this chapter. And it should be in this chapter if they were doing it, right? So what did he say? He said that they, um, he said after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God give audience, right? So I'm not going to read this whole thing. But if y'all read it, he said, give audience. Now, prove that the audience he was talking to, he taught them, look, y'all need to come out of these churches on the Sabbath day. You don't have to do it no more. Christ died. He did it all for us. He fulfilled the law. Why are y'all still in here reading the law and the prophets on the Sabbath day? Right? They didn't say any of that, did they? No, they didn't. Right? So we are proving all the way from Moses' time to Paul and him's time that the Sabbath day was kept. This is showing you that it is a perpetual covenant, brothers and sisters, never ending, never changing. If the most high don't change, why would his laws change, brothers and sisters, right? His covenant, right? That is what we want to see here, brothers and sisters, right? Now, let us continue. Let's skip down to verse 42. Verse 42, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogues, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. Now the Gentiles, we all know the Gentiles were big on sun worship, brothers and sisters, 
which is what you are worshiping when you go into these Sunday churches, right? Unfortunately, right? But if we are trying to establish that Sunday is now the day that we have our holy convocation, why did the Gentiles besought them to preach the next Sabbath day? Why didn't they do it the next day? It says the next Sabbath day, not the next day. This, this is showing you something, uh, brothers and sisters. And at this time, Sunday law was... You see what I'm saying? Sunday law wasn't even made, brothers and sisters. So how, how, do you get, how do you prove that? There is no Sunday law here, brothers and sisters. Constantine is one that made the Sunday law. That's like over 250 years after this. So there is no Sunday law. It was only the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters. Only the Sabbath day. Right? Let us continue. Um, verse 43. And when the congregation of the broken up, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. You, you, you hear that all the time. We are under grace. Right? So Paul was persuading them to continue in the grace of God. Why didn't he continue to teach them? Oh, you, you're under grace, y'all. You ain't got to keep that law. We're persuading you to continue in the grace of God, but we're, gonna, we're not going to tell you that the law is done away. Why, did, why isn't that here, brothers and sisters? Because the law ain't done away with, brothers and sisters. The law is not done away with. Let us continue. Verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together, right? The whole city came on the Sabbath day, right? So it said the whole city came together to hear the word of God. When? On the Sabbath day, brothers and sisters. I have just shown you precept upon precept, two or three witnesses, brothers and sisters, that the Sabbath day is not done away with because it is not done away. If it ain't, if it's still being kept after Christ, you know it's not done away with, right? So you can't even pull that, right? So let us continue. Now we're going back to Exodus, the 20th chapter, and we're going to get into idolatry this time, right? This is the last section, brothers and sisters, for the laws. We're going to get into idolatry. Exodus, the 20th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 3. Exodus, the 20th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 3. Exodus 20 and verse 3. 20 and 3. And verse 3 reads, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth, right? So don't have any other gods before me. You can't worship other gods other than the most high God, right? Um, he said, thou shalt, verse 5, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. I want to show you also some brothers and sisters, right? As our beloved teacher says, learning, your, <laughs> learning something on your way to learning something, right? It says he shows mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments, but he going to visit the iniquity of the people that don't keep his commandments, right? So this goes to show you no one's perfect, brothers and sisters. Those who are keeping the law, those who are keeping the commandments still need mercy. Or in other words, you still need to, um, you still need to have something where the most high is blessing you with something that you don't deserve, right? That's mercy. You sin, you die. The mercy is when you sin, he still has you here. That's mercy, brothers and sisters, because he did not give you what you deserve according to the law. That is what we have. But you have to keep the commandments to obtain mercy, brothers and sisters, right? And that is in the covenant. 
That's what it does. So you can't have an old or new covenant without keeping the commandments. Right? And you can't have mercy or grace without keeping the commandments, brothers and sisters. So it's like, it's, 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 <laughs> you might as well come and, and, and do what the Lord says, right? Because you ain't going to obtain mercy by doing what you want, right? That's, that's out of the question, right? Let us continue. Now, let's go to Joshua, the 24th chapter. Now we're, we're in Moses. Now we're going to Joshua, right? Joshua, the 24th chapter. Joshua, the 24th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 2. Joshua, the 24th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 2. Joshua 24 and verse 2. And verse 2 reads, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods, right? So we, we establishing what they did on the other side of the flood, right? Let us skip down to verse 14. Verse 14. And verse 14 reads, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on this other side of the flood, in e and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Showing you, you cannot serve other gods and the Lord. You're going to have to make a decision, brothers and sisters, right? Verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but what did Joshua say? I love this. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So y'all can go and serve other gods that, that the fathers did before us. Y'all can do that. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Once again, going back to Galatians, you either serve the flesh or you either walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit. They are contrary one to another. So if the serving of other gods was lawful, brothers and sisters, there wouldn't be no decision to make. Oh, I'm going to serve the Lord and serve these other guys, right? But he said, choose this day. And then he ended up saying, if it be evil for you to serve the Lord, you can go serve those other guys, but me and my house going to serve the Lord. Showing you the difference, brothers and sisters. So Joshua is showing that serving other guys is wrong. Wow. Now it's a, he's testifying, even though the Old Testament is still known as the law, like I said, He's still testifying to the law of Moses that God gave to Moses for the children of Israel and the strangers that sojourned with Israel, right? Not just Israel, right? Let us continue. Now let's go to uh, 2 Kings, the 17th chapter. Another witness. 2 Kings, the 17th chapter, and we're going to start at verse um, 7. 2 Kings, the 17th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 7. 2 Kings 17 and verse 7. 17 and 7. And verse 7 reads, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. So you feared those other gods. That is why you were in bondage, brothers and sisters, because you don't fear the one that created you, right? Verse 8, and walked in the statues of the heathen, right? So you walked in the statues, and this is not talking about the law of the land. I want to point that out with people, right? Because you got the law of the land, which are still statutes, but they're not religious or spiritual statutes attached to another God, brothers and sisters. So when you hear him say, you have uh, done the statues of the heathen, he's talking about for their gods, brothers and sisters, right? So you follow the statute of the gods of the heathen, right? Uh, you walk in the statues of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made, right? 
And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchmen to the fence city. So the children of Israel start building synagogues and uh, 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 churches for these other gods, brothers and sisters, right? What did it say, though? It says that they were doing things that were not right against their law. Were not right. So we're seeing that serving other gods, according to the precepts, are not right. They are against the most high, brothers and sisters, right? That is what we're seeing right now, right? Let us continue. Now let's go to the New Testament to establish that that is wrong. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 9. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. And verse 9 reads, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? So now let's establish, he said the unrighteous, right? And that they're not going to establish, the, the uh, inherit the kingdom of God. Let's see what the unrighteous are. Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, brothers and sisters, right? Idolatry, serving other gods is idolatry. So if you are serving other gods, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God, brothers and sisters, right? Let us continue. Uh, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor uh, revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So we see that serving other gods is going to keep you from the kingdom of the most high God. Y'all see how that is working? Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. That is what we are doing, brothers and sisters, right? We are establishing this, right? So now, I want to establish now that the person that gave this law, right, was Jesus. So we know we can't, uh, the law can't be done away with because Jesus is the one that gave the law. People sit here and act like Jesus came to save us from the law of, of, of the God of Israel. I'm sorry, I got, I, I got passionate on that one, right? Why would you sit here and act like Jesus came to save us from the law of the God of Israel? How much sense does that make? And he's saying that if you thought the God of Israel was the Father, he's sitting here saying, I and the Father are one. But we are one, and I'm sitting here saving you from his laws. That don't make sense, brothers and sisters. And, and, and when you really sit here and think about it, it's stupid. Let's just say it like it is. Let's call a spade a spade. It's stupid. Jesus came to save us from the laws of the God of Israel. Right? That's stupid. No, he is the God of Israel, and he is establishing his covenant with the children of Israel and with anybody else that wants to be a part of that covenant. But we're going to show, using the same process, we're going to show that Jesus is the God of Israel, brothers and sisters. Let's go to the law. Let's go to Exodus, the third chapter. Exodus, the third chapter. And this is the last section, brothers and sisters. Exodus, the third chapter, and we're going to start at verse 14. Exodus, the third chapter, and we are going to start this at verse 13. I'm sorry, 13. Exodus 3 and verse 13. Exodus 3 and verse 13. And verse 13 reads, <clears throat> excuse me, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel... And shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you. Excuse me. And they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, 
I am that I am. No, brothers and sisters, this is not his name, government name. He's establishing who he is through this name. His characteristics through his name. That is what all his names are. That is why you will not see me nor my brothers name banging. Oh, his name is Jesus. His name is Yahweh Shai. His name is No. Because they all have meaning behind it, right? And as long as you are doing the law, statutes, and commandments, and as long as you understand what the meaning of his name is, I don't care what you use, brothers and sisters. That's how we roll, right? We don't care what you use, right? Long as you ain't coming to me talking about his name as Horus or Tammuz or something, when we know that's the name of another god of another nation, then I'm straight. We, we, we straight over here, right? But like I said, this is what his attributes are, right? Let us continue. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. Verse 15, and God said moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob have sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations, right? So now we're establishing, or what we're going to establish is that Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is why you will hear me say in my lessons, um, uh, I want to give all praises, and I should have did that beforehand. I got ahead of myself. But I want to give all praises to the Elohim or the God, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Holy One of Israel, who is Jesus. That is a accurate statement. Let us go see that. Even if you don't believe that the God of Israel is Jesus, Jesus proclaimed he was the God of Israel. Or he proclaimed that he was the I Am, right? Let's go see that. Let's continue. Let's go to Isaiah, the 48th chapter. So Moses was talking about I Am. And now we're going to see Isaiah talk about this same person. Let us go to Isaiah, the 48th chapter. Isaiah, the 48th chapter. Isaiah, the 48th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 12. Isaiah, the 48th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 12. Isaiah, 48 and verse 12. And verse 12 reads, Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my call. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. So if you go which we're not going to go to uh, to save time. We're not going to go to that. But you can go to Revelation, the 22nd chapter, brothers and sisters, and Jesus is saying, I am the first and I am the last. And the God of Israel is saying, I am the first and I am the last. Now, either Jesus is a blasphemer, which I did a lesson on this as well. Even if either Jesus is a blasphemer or he is the Holy One of Israel. It's either one, right? And that's how your mentality has to be, right? Verse 13, my hand also have laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand together. So we establishing that the God of Israel is the one that created everything we see, brothers and sisters, right? It was his hands that laid the foundation of the earth, right? Let us continue. Let's skip down to verse 15. Verse 15. I, even I, have spoken, yea, I have called him, I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. Talking about Israel, right? Verse 16, come ye near unto me, hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. This is what I am is signifying, brothers and sisters, because from the time that the foundation of the world was created, there the God of Israel was. That's why he said, I am that I am. I am in the past, I am in the present, and I am also in the future at the same time. This is why we can see him giving prophecies to the prophets, and they can show you things that are surely to come to pass, brothers and sisters. His word will not come back void because he's in all spots of time. He is the I am of all generations. You get that? 
I am of all generations. And here it is saying that uh, um, from the time that it was, there am I or there I am. It's the same thing, brothers and sisters, right? And let's see what I am said. Uh, he said, and now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. So I am was sent by the Lord God. Now, even if, like I said, even if you don't agree that the Jesus is the God of Israel, you still have to prove who was this person that was sent by the Lord God of Israel or who is the Lord God of Israel that sent the Holy One of Israel, right? Who was the Lord God that sent the Holy One of Israel? So regard you you still have to you still have to figure out what that is, right? But us, we know that this is the Father and the Son, Father and Jesus. This is what we know. Let us go see that. Let's go to John the fifth chapter. And we got two more scriptures after this. John the fifth chapter, and we're gonna start at verse 36. John the fifth chapter, and we're gonna start at verse 36. John 5 and 36. John 5 and verse 36. And verse 36 reads, But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father have given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. That fills in Isaiah um, um, 48 and 16. The Lord God that sent the Holy One of Israel is the Father that sent Jesus. Right? And we're going to see this as we move forward. Verse 37. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time. You never heard his voice. Right? Or seen his shape. You haven't heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. So who was that speaking back then, brothers and sisters? That was the Son, Jesus, right? The Holy One of Israel, right? Let's continue. Um, verse 38, And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Search the scriptures. The scriptures are the Old Testament, brothers and sisters. There was no... New Testament at the time he was saying this, right? So the scriptures are the Old Testament or the law. So search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they that testify of me, brothers and sisters. They are they that testify of me. He is saying that that is him being spoken of in the law and in the prophets, brothers and sisters, right? Now let's solidify that, right? Because we want to make this case strong, right? So even if you don't believe he is, at least you know he said he was, right? Let's go to John the 8th chapter. John the 8th chapter. John the 8th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 53. John the 8th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 53. Now, of course... If you don't believe he was and you're seeing and reading what he's saying to the people, you're going to have the same um, you're going to have the same perception that these Jews had. Right. John eight and fifty three. John eight and fifty three. And verse fifty three reads, excuse me, excuse me. Are thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who makest thou thyself? Right? Who do you think you are? <laughs> hey, they was appalled. Who do you think you are? You greater than Abraham and the prophets? Right? And that's a big thing to say. If you come, if you come in on the scene talking about I am greater, or you're, he didn't necessarily say that, but if you come in on the scene even making it seem like you're greater than the uh, uh, the prophets and Abraham, the Jews going to have a problem with that, right? So let us continue. Verse 54, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honored me of whom ye say that he is your God, right? So 
because a lot of people were thinking that the God of Israel was the father. They didn't understand that that was the son that they were speaking to or that was speaking to them, right? Let us continue. Um, yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. I'm going to be a liar like you because you say you know him, but you really don't. Because you don't even believe the one he sent and you don't follow his ways, right? Let us continue. But I know him and keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, a lot of people will still say he wasn't saying that he was I am. Well, how did he see Abraham if he wasn't I am, brothers and sisters, if he wasn't the I am of all generations, meaning that he wasn't in Abraham's time, in, in, in this time, or our time, right? That is the son, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, right? He is the one that was uh, foretold to come on the scene. He is the one that is proclaiming that he is the God of Israel and that he is the God of Israel, brothers and sisters, right? So we have seen that these are how the precepts work. In order for you to know how to gain and obtain knowledge, in order for you to know the doctrine that you need to know, you must do precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, right? That's what you must do to obtain understanding. Now, let's go to the last place and see what David had to say about the precepts. Let's go to Psalms 119 this time. Psalms 119. Psalms 119, and we are going to start at verse 1. Psalms 119, and we are going to start at verse 1. Last scripture, brothers and sisters. Psalms 119 and verse 1. Psalms 119 and verse 1. And verse 1 reads, blessed are, the, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. And I don't understand how people think that once Jesus died, now I don't have to keep the laws anymore. That now makes me uh, uh, hope. I am not undefiled by not keeping the law after Christ died. As we see, that makes no sense, brothers and sisters, right? And we saw the way to figure out why that doesn't make any sense, right? Verse two, blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with a whole heart. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. So what, are he, what did he give you to command you to do laws, brothers and sisters, rules that dictate your action. He said, thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. That's showing that the precepts are the laws, right? Verse five, oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with, the, with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments, I will keep thy statutes or forsake me not utterly. So he's pleading to the Most High. I will keep your precepts. I will keep your testimonies. I will keep your laws and your judgments and your commandments. So please don't forsake me utterly. This is showing you, brothers and sisters, this is how this works. This is how you gain understanding of the God of Israel and his precepts. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And I hope you guys were uh, edified today. Once again, I am uh, Cassius Israel, a.k.a. Shazak or Kazak Ben Yehuda. Hmm. I am from the Walls of Jericho Biblical and Historical Studies, also representing the Hebrews in the Hood Entertainment. And I really hope, like I said, I really hope you guys were edified and I thank you for your time and shalom.